Alright folks, I'm back for part two of whatever that last video number was, which I still don't know. Um, we are going to try that stupid dwarf room again, <laughs> hopefully uh, successfully this time. And uh, then I'm going to finish my uh, my talk about the 911 operator job. So, I get on the job shadowing. So yeah, just to rehash what happened in the last... Oh look, something's respawning. To rehash what had happened in the last one, um, or what I spoke about, was, uh, you know, I applied for the 911 job again, got through the first test stage, got through the little interview, and then got put to the job shadowing. Before the job shadowing, though, I also had to do the, uh, like, personal history thing that contained a whole bunch of information that I didn't know, or a bunch of crap, I guess I should say. <laughs> um, it's kind of, yeah, there we go. There's some food. Perfecto. And let's go kill these bears on the off chance that I'll get another paw. Nope, no paw. <clears throat> Alright, so anyway, though, I'm on, now I'm doing the job shadowing, and I'm doing it with the, uh, the call taker. So, the first thing that I found really interesting was we got a bunch of calls for... I'm trying to think, like, in the two hour, two and a half hours I was there, probably did about 50 calls. Um, she did less than she would have normally because, like, I was there and she had to, like, answer my questions also. So she's capable of, like, disabling her system, which is, like, what you would do if you were going to the bathroom, obviously. The, uh, the system actually will auto-pick up when a call comes in after, like, a second. Um, so if you leave with the system on, uh, when somebody calls, it will get, like, routed to your terminal. And, uh, you'll just kind of... They'll just sit there and nothing will happen, which is bad. You don't want to do that. Uh, by the way, before I get talk about this, though, one of the things I want to mention is I got there. I went to the, the dispatch side first, right? I'm at the dispatch, and uh, I look at the, like, desk. They've got this, like, really nice-sized desk. It's all, like, got movable sections in it and stuff, too. Just a wonderful desk. So much better than my tiny thing. Six computer screens. Six computer screens, two keyboards, a number pad, three computer mice, all with trackballs. Which is, I guess, why they use trackballs, because if you had three actual computer ma mice with cords, because you don't want them to, you don't want the battery to die. So yeah, if you had, uh, <laughs> if you had three regular computer mice, all with cords, uh, on one desk, it would be a, uh, it would, you know, just not a situation you can work with. Uh, I was just like, dude, I wish I had a desk like this. Um, one screen is for internet. One screen is a map. One screen has the location and, like, status of all of the, uh, like, emergency services that are in your area that you're covering. Um, one is the radio. One is the call. Wait, map, status, ah. One is the call, like, thing. So when somebody calls, it gives you their information, like, um, who the caller is. If you're calling from a landline, it'll give you, like, the address. If you're not, it'll just be, like, it's Verizon. But it also, like, I'll, I'll get into this, but it has, like, location data mixed in. Um, a lot of stuff. <laughs> but, yeah, six screens. I was just like, oh, man, I wish I had six screens on my computer. I'm tr like I'm trying to get two screens on my computer and I can't fit them onto my desk. To be fair, my one screen is bigger than any of the individual one screens the number one center had. But still, still six screens. Oh man, it's beautiful. Brought a tear to my eye. Um. Anyway, so uh, we got like about fifty calls. I want to say. Uh, quite a few of them, we got like four calls that were, I guess, like a person accidentally dialing it with, the, with their phone in their butt or something like that, a butt dial. I'm not sure exactly how you butt dial 911. Um, I'm looking at my phone, I like, I was talking to my, uh, my stepbrother actually, uh, and he has an iPhone. My phone has an option to, without like engaging the password, to dial emergency services. Um, that way, like, I guess somebody else could take my phone and call 911 if they desperately needed to. Um, 
and there's a there was a button on my phone. His phone allowed him to do the same thing, but he didn't have this extra button. When you push the like, look at that, two battleships. When you push the uh, like dial emergency or emergency call only thing, it brings up the uh, like number pad. For me though, at the bottom there was a button that you could just hit that would immediately dial nine one one. Um, his didn't have that button, so I'm not really sure. But so I guess it's it's possible that I could trigger my screen uh, with it being in my pocket. That I mean that seems relatively easy. And then I could hit that emergency call only button, and then I could hit the one that just auto dials nine one one. I didn't try it because I didn't want to call 911 accidentally. But I'm not sure, like, when you, on my phone, when you dial a number, you still have to hit, like, the go button. You know, like, you've dialed this number. Are you sure you want to set it in case you push the buttons wrong, basically? I'm not sure if I would have had to done that there, so it might have been an additional button. I feel like that's an awful lot to do accidentally with your phone being in your butt, but whatever. Um, it happened, like, four times. Depending on what we hear in the background, uh, I forgot there's dwarf guards that are going to be right in here. Yeah, depending on what we hear, we uh, we call back, and then depending on what we hear, we might just send the police to investigate. Um, if like literally nothing could be heard, we you know we don't we'll try a call back, but if you don't pick up or anything, uh, we don't really do anything at that point. If there was like banging or like voices that's a little bit different of a situation um but yeah we got a couple of those calls another thing that we got calls for which i was su i was surprised but like i guess i shouldn't have been is we got several calls from like i want to say like private security companies and like alarm companies that were like you know like for businesses but also some people pay to have them in their houses i can't remember the names of them which is funny, though, because we have a sign for it in front of my house to be like, this house is monitored by a company uh, in the hopes that people will see that sign and be like, oh, man, I don't want to break into that house, even though we don't actually have the service. Um, but, yeah, they'll call and be like, yeah, we've got an alarm triggered. Um, so, like, when, when if you have that and your alarm gets triggered, the company calls the house to try to see if like you accidentally triggered it or something, or at least you know what it is. If you're not there because you're at work or you've been murdered by people breaking into your house, these are all equally possible, uh, <laughs> then they call the police. So they call the police and then they're like, we've got a you know alarm triggered, the system is saying that it's the garage door, or the system's saying it's like a back window or whatever, depending on what their system actually says. Uh, but they'll be like, yeah, so we've got this, we've got the triggered alarm, um, we tried to call them, no response, so we send the police, and then they'll keep trying to, like, contact the homeowner, and stuff like that. So, a lot of the calls were that. Um, now I'm, I'm going to, well, I'm going to stop talking when we get there, but I've got a little while to go, so I'll keep talking. Um. Now, I didn't get that we, uh, when I was there, I didn't get one, but they said they get a lot of calls for, like, reckless drivers, and they also said they hate calls for reckless drivers, which, which makes sense when you think about it, because, and this is why, like I said, this was, like, a really informative process. Um, when you see a reckless driver, that means he's driving, right? <laughs> so, it takes a little while for the police to get to, like, a location. So, when you report a reckless driver, you're, like... I'm driving down this road, there's a guy in front of me, he could turn at any given point, but he's driving recklessly, and now it's going to be five minutes until the police officer gets there. So the police officer has to, like, estimate where this guy is going, uh, and that's usually not really going to work. Um, and then also, with, like, reckless driver calls, usually the person that's calling in the reckless driver call has just been, like, cut off by the person, so they're panicking or they're angry, so they're not really in, like, the perfect state of mind. Um, and a lot of times, in their hearts of hearts, they know they might have been a little bit responsible for some of the uh, the situation there, too, so they over-exaggerate to kind of, like, hide that fact. Um, so they were saying, like, you'll get, like, um, 
reckless driver calls where the person will be like, he was driving erratically and he was waving around a gun. And then, like, the police will pull the person over after they find him, and it'll be, he didn't have a gun, he was on his phone. And it's like, well, that was a an object that looked kind of like a phone, maybe. <laughs> or maybe like a gun. All right, let's get them out of the, uh, the poison now. I guess I should fully heal, because it's only going to be a matter of time until they drain my crap anyway. Yeah, I'm almost positive when I looked online, it said dwarf guards do not walk through poison. And I'm almost positive these dwarf guards are all just casually walking through my poison. Kill the ones that are near me first. So yeah, they said uh, reckless driver calls are a pain in the butt. Uh, which, like I said, makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Oh, God, I so desperately wish I could just finish him off right now. Instead of, like, missing an additional eight times and then having him uh, come back. <laughs> Alright, let's kill some of these dwarf soldiers. Next. Alright. Yeah, you walk on that poison, foo. Let's kill this dwarf guard. Why do I have my backpack open? This is an excellent question. Why do I have my backpack open? So I got a call then, uh, this one was the one I laughed at, by the way. I mentioned that, that I accidentally laughed when I, and that's how I discovered that my microphone actually was active. Um, the dude calls, and I guess he was, like, living at, like, uh, like a home or something. By the way, I'm, I'm altering information a little bit here so that it's, I'm not violating the confidentiality thing. Anyway, dude calls, uh, and he's like, yeah, I've been, I've been here for, like, three years, like, three years and six months. Uh, and I, I just feel like the staff doesn't respect me. And I think they should respect me more. <laughs> We're like, okay. He's like, I don't want you to send the police. Like, I, I don't need anybody to be he come here, but I just I just think they should respect me more. They, it's not like they're they're not mistreating me, or they're not doing anything. I just think they're, they're not respecting me. We're like, okay, well... Do you, like, what I'm, you know, like, what do you want from us? He's like, I mean, nothing. I, like, I, I don't want you to send the police. I don't need the police. But I just, I think that they should respect me more. So we're like, all right, well, we're going to send the police. He's like, no, I don't need the police. But they, they just, they just don't respect me. We're like, all right, well, enjoy your police because you're getting the police now. So we send them the police. <laughs> um, to be fair, that's, that's when I laugh, by the way. Because he, he was like... He was all like really sad. I, he was like, "Oh, you know, I've I, I've been here, and it's just, you know, it's been like three some years. And I, I I don't know. I just feel like, you know, it's like it's the staff here. They just, I I just don't think they. Res and it was like he f he finally says what he was calling about, and it was just like, are you joking, dude? <laughs> and and that's why I laughed. Um, but you know, like we. In, in the off chance that he was, like, being actually, like, abused by the staff or, like, taken advantage of in some way, shape, or form, uh, we do have to, like, investigate that. Um, and, I mean, heck, if the staff is just, like, giggling at this dude behind his back, kind of like I did, um, having a police officer, like, show up and be like, well, all right, what's the situation here, might get them to stop. I mean, to be fair, at the same time, it's just as likely that they're going to get annoyed that he called the 911 over that, and that they're going to, like, more intently disrespect him, but, hey, whatever. Um, I got a lady who called... This one was actually kind of wild. She calls, and she goes, I want to report a theft. So when a person wants to report a theft, you have to, like, you know... When? Because if it's a, like a theft in progress, like you're being held up at gunpoint, that's a whole lot different of a situation than uh, somebody broke into my car last night kind of situation. 
um, you know, a crime in progress means we need to send the police to, like, right this second kind of situation. Uh, so she's like, it happened yesterday. We're like, oh, okay. Uh, Cole. Oh, up there. Eh, Cole's only used for that event, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, we, uh, she calls, she wants to report a theft that happened yesterday. We're like, oh, okay. So, uh, you know, before we re usually ask, um, like, first we got to get their basic situation, right? So it's like, I want to report a theft. We're like, okay, theft being reported. Um, before we get into any details, name, address, you know, that kind of stuff. Phone number, just in case the phone disconnects and we, can, we want to be able to call you back. Because, uh, you know, that happens. Cell phones drop calls every now and then. <laughs> Uh, and we do, well, like, we do callbacks and stuff like that. Um, oh, I got two Geomancers. 104, 110. He yielded for 111, and then I hit him for 107. He yielded for 115, and I hit him for 92. I missed. 1045, and he yields for 80. There we go. Uh. So, you know, and, like, all right, so we're, like, all right, the name of the, uh, the address, the, the theft, all right, so what happened? And she's, like, all right, so I went to this lady's house yesterday, and, uh, I went to buy some heroin, and we're, like, okay. Apparently, uh, that's a relatively common occurrence. People, like, call to report things that happened while they themselves were committing a crime. Um, technically... You, like, can't get arrested for that. So, it's actually fine. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's actually, like, fine to report that kind of stuff. Because they don't want, like, people taking advantage of, you know, like, people doing drugs and stuff like that. So, like, she's not going to get arrested for calling and being like, I was, uh, buying heroin. Um. So, yeah, though. So, she's like, yeah, I was, I was buying heroin from this lady. And uh, she gave me a lethal dose of heroin. And then while I was dying, she didn't even call, like, the ambulance. She just sat there and watched. And then she stole my tablet. And I want my tablet back. And I'm like, yo, this lady sounds really good for somebody who overdosed on heroin yesterday. I mean, she's, like, in great condition. Um, so we're, we're like, okay. Uh, and she's got all these, like, kids screaming in the background, and she's like, I'm sorry, my kids are screaming, because they want their tablet back. I'm like, why'd you take, did you take your kids with you when you went to go get the lethal dose of heroin? Or did you take your kid's tablet with you and left your kids somewhere when you were going to get the heroin? Uh, she's like, somebody else had to call the ambulance, then she stole my tablet, and I need my tablet back for my kids, so we're like, alright, well, uh, we need to send a police officer to, like, get a statement from you. Where are you at? Uh, so she gives us the address, and, like, when we plug it into the system, it, like, pops it up. So she's, like, living in a homeless shelter with four kids. And I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was, like, that was pretty wild. Um, send the police to her. <laughs> so, uh, that happened. Um, you know, I asked them, like, how often does the SWAT team get sent out? And they are like, the SWAT team gets sent out way more often than you would think. We're not, like, a high-crime area, right? Um, and I, like, and, you know, I also asked them, like, how often does something major happen? And they were, like, really rarely, actually. Like, um, it's very rare that the police forces here, like, ever fire their weapons and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's not like we're having, like, shootouts with the police. We don't have a, uh, helicopter. I asked that, actually. Um, if we ever needed one, we could borrow one from Philadelphia, but we don't have one. Um, I'm surprised I managed to get through this this time. But yeah, so, like, you know, no, we got no helicopter, which I felt was, like, a little disappointing. Um, like, hospital helicopters... By the way, I just want to mention this, and I, I don't know how this works for the rest of the world, but um, 
at least in my state of Pennsylvania, we've always referred to the helicopters as uh, medevacs. Um, I don't know how common that is for the rest of the world or the rest of the country even. The thing that's interesting though is medevac is actually a like specific company. Um, and they have like the rights to that name, medevac. Uh, it's actually like, I'm trying to think, um, Kleenex, for instance, um, they're actually called tissues. Kleenex is a company that's just become like the dominating company in the tissue industry. So a lot of people are just like, I need a Kleenex. Um, and Kleenex, the company, hates that because you'll be like, I need a Kleenex, and then you'll take some other company's thing. Um, so you're like not using their, their name has become so widespread that it's no longer unique to their product kind of situation. Uh, it kind of happens, I think, with Coca-Cola, too. Like, I'll be like, oh, I need to get a Coke. Um, and then I'll grab, like, a Pepsi or a generic one. No, no, <laughs> that wasn't a Coke. <laughs> the word is cola. I need to go grab a cola, not a Coke. I got my Warhammer and I got my Dwarven Axe. Yay, quest completo. And now my carrying capacity is all filled. I want to switch back to my uh, crossbow for my trip back out. I'm going to go be stupid, and I'm going to jump down that hole. And then die. That's that's my game plan. I'm going to jump down that hole, and then die. Just because I, I wa I'm pretty confident I know what's down that hole, but I, I, I want to double check, because I make poor decisions all the time. I'm going to heal fully just to make sure that I don't like get popped in one shot and die. Because that would be unfortunate. Oh, you suck. I gotta just focus on the guards first, because I know I'm not gonna be able to kill the Geomancer in any kind of like meaningful time frame. Uh, especially when I'm using the crossbow. And then after I start focusing on the. Uh, oh, good. Another Geomancer. Yeah, after I start focusing on the Geomancer and then it, like, I get the two dwarf guards on top of me, I need to switch and then everything I did at that point is just wasted because the Geomancer fully heals itself. So I gotta, I gotta stop doing that. I gotta stop being an idiot, I think, is my problem in life, just in general. Alright. I don't even know if the Geomancers are capable of dropping anything that I would care about. Uh, I don't even know which ones I recently killed. One gold coin that I don't care about. What about you? Alright, take that. Take my 14 gold. Yeah, I think I almost preferred the, the previous system where it would just close the most recent one. Oh, I got another Geomancer. And then a guard. Like I said, I'll get used to it, though. Um, Alright, let's go be stupid. Let's do this. I'm gonna die. I can, I can feel it. <laughs> I'm gonna die. I think they can make you drunk. I'm gonna get made drunk, and then it's just gonna... Um, yeah, alright, I'm leaving. Yep, we're done. <laughs> I saw one. That's all I wanted to do. Uh, and then to uh, commemorate that, I popped that as two dwarf soldiers in one shot. How nice is that? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so uh, anyway, the SWAT team does get called out about once a week, if not more, which was surprising to me, especially since they, you know, were like, yeah, we're not really, like, nothing major happens all that often. Uh, there was a bank robbery the day before I was there, actually, which was interesting. But the dude just, like, walked into a bank and was like, I would like the money. <laughs> and they were like, uh, no. And he was like, okay. And then he went to a different bank, like, immediately afterwards. 
and was like, I would like the money. And they were like, uh, no. And he was like, bummer. And he left, but because, you know, the first bank had already called the police, they caught him. Uh, it wasn't like, you know, a hostage situation, you know, shootout with the police. It was just kind of an idiot, come to think of it. But, um, the SWAT team does get called, though, about once to tw twice a week because if you call the police and you're like, I can't take this anymore, like, my life sucks, I just want it to end, they call the SWAT team for that because you've, like, you're probably barricading yourself in your house. Um, <clears throat> and it's really only the SWAT team that's capable of, like, breaking and enter, like, breaching your house, I guess I should say. Um... The normal police can, like, you know, knock out a window or something like that, but they're not trained to stop you from shooting yourself. Uh, to, like, take you down really quickly and things like that. And, uh, you know, the SWAT team also has a sniper if that becomes a necessary situation. So, most of the time, the SWAT team gets called for just some, like, kind of drunk, depressed person who's like, oh, I want to end. And then they, like, you know, they usually just talk the dude down, but even if they don't, they kind of just, like, break in, knock him out. Knock him down, I should say. And then are like, all right, no more suicide for you. And he's like, I won't do it anymore. And that's kind of the end of the situation. Um, then the last call I was there for. Dude calls. This is actually a really interesting call, I have to say. Um, terrible, but really interesting. Dude calls, and he's like, I need to report. He's panicking, by the way. He's, like, clearly super panicking. He's like, I need to report a woman. Uh, she passed out on this road. Oh, now here's a fun fact about it, right? Okay, so um, when you... First of all, when, when I have to call, like, I have to send the police to you, right? Um, I send... I have to figure out what township you're in because I have to send that township's police. Um, <clears throat> when you call... With a cell, f all right. When you call with a house phone, obviously it it pops up your address. So I'm like, okay, this dude's you know at one two three Fake Street. Gotcha. Can we kill this dwarf like today, please? And I lagged there. Looked like. Um. So yeah, <laughs> you know, at that point, I know where you're calling from. But when you call with a cell phone, actually, it uses the towers to like triangulate your position. Um. It usually is extremely accurate. Oh, I'm lagging again. Um, so when it does that, and it takes like a little bit of time to actually do it, but when it does that, it'll pop up a thing on the call like screen that's it'll give you a percentage of how confident we are in this in the in the number. So usually it's like 90, and that's good. Anything really lower than like 80 is you basically can't use it. Um, but it'll be like, we're 91% confident that you're at this location. And then what it does is it goes, um, it pulls up like a map and it goes, you're here. And then it'll go, you're within a certain amount of meters of this location. And then it tells you how confident they are in that assessment. So it'll be like, we're 93% confident that you're within 14 meters of this location. Um, if it's anything below 80% confidency, uh, it's not really useful. And if it's... I'm still having so much time trouble killing these stupid things. Um, sometimes it'll be like we're 99% confident that you're within 4,000 meters of this location. That's also not useful. Um, but usually, like, the longer you stay on the call, uh, it'll, like, narrow it down. But anyway, we have to double check because, like, even then at that thing, you could be standing on, like, the border of a uh, township and we have to make sure we're sending the right ones also some of the uh the townships in my county um good god i'm dying okay we're switching back to the spears because that crossbow blows um I swear, it's as inaccurate as the spears, but it deals less damage. And then as I say that, I start hitting really low hits with the spears. Oh my god, look, I, like, I cannot kill him. There we go. <laughs> He's healing faster than I'm damaging him. I feel like I'm fighting a Hydra. 
Except that mana drains me. And come to think of it, it's almost as dangerous as a Hydra. I mean, Hydras hit a lot harder, but... They hit via waves that can be dodged. Look, I, I just want to leave this place, and I can't do it because of how ineffective I am at killing these things. Look at this. Look at this. I cannot kill him. There we go. And I got some worthless items out of him. Great. Uh, likewise, you know, I'm in Montgomery County, and, um... If you're, like, on the border of a different county, sometimes it'll send you into us. So, uh, you know, like, if you're in Bucks, if you're close enough to the border, it might get routed to our thing. Um, and the opposite happens, obviously. So when that happens, we have to, like, get the information from you, and then we just transfer you to the correct county. But for the township kind of situation, we need to really need to know which township you're in. Uh, it's made worse, too, by, like... The townships aren't... Oh, God. <laughs> the, uh, the townships aren't the same thing as, like, the town names and stuff like that. Uh, which is, like, more annoying because, like, Pottstown is a major town in my, uh, in my county, right? But Pottstown is actually, like, four townships. And one of those townships is actually called Pottstown Township. Um... So people will be like, I'm in Pottstown. But you're like, well, no, you're actually in Lower Pottsgrove. <laughs> That is incorrect. Uh, so if I sent the pots down, please, it would be a problem. But anyway, uh, before I actually talk about the last call I received, I do want to mention something else. At one point, uh, the Philadelphia call center had transferred a call to us, and it was, it was like, hilarious. We had transferred calls to Philadelphia, I think, like, twice, and basically what we do is, like, we're transferring you, right? So we say to the person, like, we're, we're transferring you to Philly. So we'd like, there's a little button we push, it connects us to Philly, and then we're like, uh, hey Philly, this is Montgomery County, we have a, uh, uh, a transfer for you, you know, here's the person. So the Philly, look, I can't, like, this is absurd. Miss, 130. Heals for 112. Hits for 163. Miss. There we go. Absurd. I can't wait to get real weapons that have, like, high accuracy. Paladins will always have that annoyance of, oh, good god. <laughs> I just, I just want to leave. Paladins will always have that annoyance of, uh, like, inconsistent damage, where they'll be like, 639 damage! Four! Um, but at least I'll have the not missing situation. I'll, t I'll get rid of that. Um, so yeah, uh, Philly contacts us, and Philly's like, oh, this is Montgomery County, I got a transfer for you. We're like, alright, what's the situation? He's like, uh, person called, they're from your county. We're like, yeah, I mean, okay. He's like, alright, here's the name, and we're like, are you transferring them? He's like, no, I hung up on them. We're like, uh, okay. <laughs> like, you just hung up on somebody that called 911. Alright, that's good. Uh, and by good, I mean bad. So dude's like, yeah, it's like the name, and he gives some kind of like ethnic sounding name that like I couldn't pronounce or and understand. And the girl I was with was like, oh, what's that? He's like, I don't know, I couldn't understand it. We're like, okay. He's like, here's their phone number. So he like throws the phone number at us, and then we're like, okay, um, well, there's a whole bunch of people there. We're like, okay, uh, what's the call about? And he's like, I don't know, they broke something. Might have been a leg, might have been an arm. Anyway, bye. And then he hung up on us. I was like, yo, Philly's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I do not remember there being this many dwarf guards here last time. Uh, I just so desperately want to <laughs> finish him with the strike. Now it's, like, extra annoying, too, because, uh, like, they're hurting me, and the time where I could have just finished him off with a strike, I'm, like, taking additional hits. It's killing me inside. Oh, there's another one I could have finished off with a strike. Killing me.
mean, I want to make another video after this, and I'm not going to because it's uh, it's getting hot in my room, and I gotta turn my air conditioner on after a while. So yeah, Philly Philly Carl Center is awesome. My only advice is to not be a victim of a crime in Philadelphia. Um. Anyway, last call I had on, right? Guy calls, he's all, like, panicking and stuff, and we, uh, oh yeah, this is actually what led me to this. One of the interesting things is, if you're on the highway, you're the state police, okay? Um, uh, doesn't matter what township you're in, if you're on the highway, it's the state police. Uh, but the on and off ramps are not considered highway. They're considered whatever township's in. So if you, like, crash your car and you're like, oh, I'm on the... I'm on the expressway, and I gotta be like, are you actually on the expressway, or are you on the on-ramp to the expressway? Because there's a difference. <laughs> there's a big difference, in fact. Um, but anyway, so, like, we gotta get that information from the dude. The dude's all, like, panicking and, like, clearly upset. So the woman just, she passed out, uh, and he's like... He's like, I'm, I'm on, he, he names the road, but we're like, we need a mile marker. And he's like, I, I, I don't know what mile marker. We're like, all right, where are you going, east or west? He's like, I, I, I don't know what I'm going, east or west. We're like, do you know what township you're in? He's like, no, I don't know what township I'm in. I don't know where I'm at. And he's freaking out. He keeps talking about the woman, which I feel like is, a, to be fair, like, I guess what a lot of people do when they call 911. And we're like, okay, you know. You're not, like, we're trying to get the information out of him, and we have to be, like, calm and, you know, keep asking, because we need that information. Finally, somebody else takes the phone from this dude, and this dude is like, uh, I'm a sergeant with the police, I I'm off duty, but I was driving and I saw this, so, like, I'm a first responder. We're like, okay, you know, he gives us the name, his name and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so he's like... He's like, the woman's in a car that crashed. And we're like, okay, that was a bit of information that the panicking man did not give us. Because he had, like, made it out to be, like, there was a woman on this, like, highway, and she just passed out. Not that she passed out while driving a car. <laughs> um, and then the cop is like, <clears throat> she's, her breathing is very, very shallow and irregular. She's p pale and, like, clammy. The cop is, and the cop's like, she's definitely, like, overdosing on something. So he, like, turns to the guy and is like, I need to know, you know, I need to know what she took. And the dude is like, I, I, I don't know, I didn't take anything. I don't, I don't know. Like, all right, I mean, that makes sense for a dude that just saw this happening. So then, the, like, the, we asked the cop, we're like, um, do we know the name of the woman? So he asks that to the guy, and the guy gives the woman's name. And I'm like, how does this guy know the woman's name, right? <laughs> um, would have loved the divine strike, that one. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, how does the dude know the name of this woman? And she's like, she's 27. Uh, so as it turns out, the dude was in the car with her. He was trying to pass this off as him being like, a, oh, I just stumbled upon this. When in reality, he was, like, in the car with her, probably also doing the drugs that she was doing. Uh, and that's why he was trying to, like, distance himself from the situation, because he didn't want to get, like, arrested for doing the drugs. So the cop is like, well, look, we've got, it's called, like, the Good Samaritan's Law. In these kind of situations, if you tell us what she's taking, you can't be arrested. And the guy still is like, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. So the cop starts doing CPR, because the lady stops breathing. Um, Another dude pulls up his car. This one's not a cop. He's just a civilian. The cop gives him the phone because the other guy's freaking out and can't be doing anything. So we're, like, talking to that guy. We're sending the, uh, like, the ambulance. The cop's still doing CPR. He can't get the information about what she took from the dude. Uh, the, like, the ambulance is, like, five minutes away or something like that. And then the cop's finally, like, I'm discontinuing CPR. She's, I've got no pulse and she's not breathing. <laughs> like, Oh man, the last the last call I was on, the lady overdosed from heroin and died. I was just like, man. I mean, it might not have been heroin, but heroin's the uh, kind of go-to drug in my area that would allow you to overdose and die. Um, we don't really have like a big thing with like meth or like coke or anything like that. So I mean, it's almost almost certainly heroin. It might have been something else though. Um, I I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that was the last call for my job shadowing. I was like, whoa. 
Uh, and then after job shadowing, I had to go to a training, th or like a group interview was called. And uh, I'm, before I talk about the group interview, I kind of want to go off on a little tangent. Um, one of the things we, we asked the people at the group interview, but this was like afterwards, was, you know, like various questions about like what's the worst kind of calls and things like that you get. But one of the things I found interesting was they were like, and again, this makes sense. You never get any kind of like closure. Like, I'll never get, even if I work there, obviously, I'll never get any kind of follow-up information on that lady who overdosed and died. Um, whether or not it was heroin, whether or not she was actually on any kind of drug, um, whether or not what happened to the dude, like, I'll, I mean, I could kind of, like, if I cared enough, I could, like, look up, like, public records and stuff like that and try to figure things out that way. But for the most part, um, I'll never really know. Um... Like, one of the guys we were asking this question to at the group interview, he was like, he said the worst call he ever received was, um, he got a thing about, like, two kids that were, like, seven and eight or something like that that drowned in a pool, and he was trying to, like, get the mom to do CPR while she was having, like, a nervous breakdown. Uh, this got really heavy all of a sudden, I know. <laughs> um, he was like, you know, once the EMTs get there, though, like, for those kind of things where it's, like, a pressing medical concern... The 911 people stay on the phone with you um, until the EMTs get there, or the police, or the fire department. But, uh, you know, for other things, like, you're like, oh, it was a car accident, I'm not injured. We're like, all right, the police are going, um, we're, you know, we're hanging up. But, uh, yeah, for those things, we stay on with you. Especially, like, we had to walk the, they would, he had, that guy had to, like, walk the mom through stuff like that. Uh, but once the EMTs get there, we, like, hang up. Um, I wonder if that guy's gonna go pick up all my stuff. I'm not coming back for it, so I don't care. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, he's like, you know, I never, uh, to this day, I still don't know if those two kids survived. Did they make it? Did they not? I don't know. Did one of them? He's like, you, you, you rarely get closure. Um, the times you do tend to be, like, noteworthy, and they, they told us this story. Hold on, I'm gonna drink something real quick. Give me a sec. Pomegranate lemonade. I, I enjoy that, surprisingly, a lot. He said, you know, like, we had um, this, like, elderly woman. She called, and she was like, her husband fell. He's okay. Like, he just got a dizzy spell, and he fell. He's not, like, injured. Nothing's, you know, nothing's broken. He's perfectly fine. But he can't get himself up, and she's too weak to get him up either. So she just wants us to, like, send a police officer to, you know, pick her up. Um, she's like, I don't need an ambulance though. But the uh, the like the nine one operator she was talking to was like, um, uh, are you like has this happened before? And she's like, oh, it happened. He gets like dizzy spells every now and then. And she's like, you know, maybe that's something you might want to like check out. You know, get that checked out or something. She's like, you think so? So the nine one operator was like, yeah, why don't we send an ambulance and we'll get him to the hospital, you know, and they'll take care of him. So she was like, okay, let's do that. Then. So sh that woman had called, like, a week later to be like, hey, I just want to let you guys know um, when uh, we took him to the hospital, they, like, ran tests, they found he had a blood clot in his heart, uh, which was, like, limiting his circulation and was leading to the dizzy spells. Um, and, like, that would have eventually have given him a heart attack or, like, you know, cut off oxygen to his brain and would have killed him. If we hadn't taken him to the hospital, we would have never known about it, and he would have died. So, you know, if we hadn't listened to your advice, he, my husband would be dead. Uh, and they also, like, that was one example, and another example they gave was a, um... I'm gonna go back and get my stuff, actually. Because I want to keep talking a little bit. <laughs> uh, one of the examples they gave was, uh, they helped a lady give birth through the phone, actually. And, uh, she came... She actually, like, um, you know, two months later, she brought the baby into the 911 center to be like, you saved my baby. Um, you know, and they said, like, occasionally people will, like, you know, send thank yous and stuff like that. But for the most part, you don't, you don't get any kind of closure. Uh, but on the topic of, like, the worst calls, that guy, he had said that. Um, the one woman that was there at the group interview thing, she said, the, like, the worst calls that she gets... Um, and she consistently gets them. 
It was interesting, by the way, too. Nobody was like, the worst calls are, like, domestic disturbances or things like that. Like, nobody was like, I guess there's not a lot of those. Or I guess that's kind of just in the realm of TV. That, like, a woman would call and be like, my husband's beating me right this second. That doesn't, like, actually happen, I guess, in the real world. Um... <laughs> Women get beat by their husband. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, like, the woman won't call often from, like, locking herself in the closet while her husband's going crazy. That doesn't actually happen. Uh, often, at least. Um, but, yeah. They, so they were kind of, they were consistently, like, the worst cause you'll receive under most circumstances, though, is either, like, kids dying. Uh... <laughs> Or they said, like, the most depressing thing that you'll get often. Because, like, to be fair, like, I mean, how many times is somebody's kids going to drown? Once, because their child is drowned. And if it happens twice, you know, you should probably start investigating that family. But they said what you do get a decent amount of, and what's, like, depressing as all heck, is you'll get, like, an elderly person, a couple, and they'll call and they'll be like, I, uh, I woke up and my husband's dead in the bed next to me. Oh, man. And because they're always, like... Like, when a parent's... They were, they were trying to... They were explaining it this way. Like, when a parent's kid dies, they're, like, overwhelmed with, like, emotion. But it's, like, a panicky, like, terror she type emotion. Uh, where they're, like... They're freaking out, in other words. They were, like, when an, like an elderly person is, like, my husband's dies, they're just, like, overwhelmed with sadness and, like, despair and sorrow. And they're like, my partner for the last 60 years is dead now. I don't know what I'm going to do. They're like, oh, man, this is, like, just the most depressing thing ever. Um, I'm, uh, I'm lacking super heavy right now. And for whatever reason, I'm not attacking that, and I don't understand why. Okay. Maybe I should not go back. The one lady, they were uh, they were all like, all of our worst calls, though, don't compare to this lady's worst call. And she's like, uh, I hate telling the story, but I'll tell the story. So her story was they got a call from a restaurant um, about, a, like, an elderly gentleman that was there, and he was having a heart attack. So they're, like, you know, she's giving them, like, the CPR directions. Uh, why am I lagging so much all of a sudden? She's giving them the CPR directions. Um, <clears throat> you know, walking them through that. And, you know, at the same time, she's, like, getting the information, like, all right, where are you at? June 28th. I hate when people don't put their, uh, I'm here letters away when they leave. Basically, like, most of those people are botters, too. Just want to throw this out there. <laughs> like, I'm botting here, and I don't want anybody to bother me and interrupt my botting rate, so I'm going to leave a note here that's like, I'm here, and then I'm not going to take it away when I leave. Anyway. So she's doing the thing. She gets the like the address, and she's like, oh, is that, like, Salvatore's Pizza? And they're like, yes. And she's like, oh, I, you know, I go there all the time. This is terrible. I always go here with my dad, who's an elderly gentleman in his 60s. Uh, do you know the name of the gentleman? They're like, oh, I don't know his name, but he's a regular. Like, oh, man. So, uh, she, like, calls her dad's cell phone while she's still, like, on the phone with the, the dude. And her, like, dad's not picking up, but the guy on the, like, on the phone is like, oh, his phone's ringing. And she's like, oh, it's my dad. So, uh, another call taker took over for her, and she, like, rushed to the hospital. But, uh, she didn't make it in time. He died before he got there. Everybody in the room was like, ooh. That's, uh, that's pretty terrible. Anyway, I want to talk about this group interview. So, group interviews. I'm not 100% certain exactly what they are, but I know that the thing I experienced was not a normal group interview. Uh, my understanding of group interviews is you sit there in a group while, like, multiple interviewers are there, and they ask the group, like, questions. So you answer your their questions in front of, like, your peers that are looking for the same job as you. Um... That's my understanding of a group interview. I'm not sure if that's an accurate understanding, but that's my understanding of a group interview. Um, and I'm expecting the group to be like five or six people. So I get there and there's like 39 people there. 
Um, so they split us into three groups of 13. I was, uh, I was group two. And then they send us off into separate rooms in our groups. So group two went into one room. And uh, they give us... Th this was a while, right? All right, so they give me this piece of paper. It's a front and back page. So it's like two pages, essentially. Um, and half of it is like biographical information on 13 fictional people. But the it, it has a scenario, right? So the scenario is you're at your uncle's house having like hosting a party with 13 of your friends whose biographical information is below. And while you're there, terrorists detonate a nuclear bomb in the nearby city. Uh, luckily, though, your uncle's house has a fallout shelter. So you go into the fallout shelter, and uh, you get, like, the emergency broadcast, and it says you should not leave the shelter for a month. But your shelter only has enough food and uh, space for seven people. I'm going the wrong way. I'm an idiot. For seven people, including yourself. <clears throat> So that means out of your 13 friends, only six of them can come into the shelter with you. And the other seven are going to be abandoned to the radioactive wasteland that has become Philadelphia, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> so as a group, they split our group of 13 people into two smaller groups first. Uh, as our smaller group, we had to determine which of the six people we're taking with us. Which was just like so out there, I don't even know what to say. It was, however, a very interesting and fascinating uh, process. So, uh, eventually, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but uh, they, after we, like, as our small group came up with who we were taking, they uh, brought us back to the, um, the, they, like, recombined our two smaller groups and back into the full group, too, and we had to, like, kind of consolidate. Um, Everybody in our group, both group, our group two entity, took the same, like, we need to maximize survival chance, like a very, like, logical and analytical approach. Um, nobody was like, we should do this, like, on the humanity. You know, like, if you ever saw the movie Titanic, um, they were, like, women and children first, because that's, like, the humanitarian, like, gentlemanly thing to do. We were like, no, nah, no, nah, doesn't matter. We're, we're killing the young people because they don't have useful skills. Sorry, get out of our far out, fallout shelter, youngs, and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's very interesting in that sense. And I don't know if that was the correct response or not. That's, that's how I personally would have done it if it was like actually me in that situation. Because um, it would maximize my survival chances, but uh, I don't know if that's actually like the correct choice or not. But anyway. So, like, the one dude is, like, Jose something. I don't remember. I don't really remember the last names. Um, he wasn't actually there for the party. He was there repairing your air conditioner. And he's not educated, but he has, like, a basic understanding of, uh, like, mechanical stuff. And, you know, he was capable of repairing the, like, filtration system on the, the fallout shelter and stuff like that. So all of us were basically, like, Jose is a necessity. Um, if our fallout shelters, like, air purification system, our filtration system stops working, we're all just doomed. So, Jose, you know, we need Jose. Um, <clears throat> there was, like, one woman who was described as she was, like, she was a nutritionist, and she was good at, like, you know, rationing out the food and stuff like that. But she was described as being, like, uh, very, like, flirty and stuff like that. And then she was also a chain smoker. Um... So, like, you know, we decided not to take her because uh, mostly everybody focused on the fact that she was a chain smoker, which meant she'd either be smoking in our uh, fallout shelter or she wouldn't be smoking and then she'd be a very irritated person while we were in a very high-stress situation. So we didn't take her. Um, Jose was described as being, like, not very... Um, he didn't have, like, good self-control. Like, he he was caught taking extra food because he was hungry. He didn't, like, sneak it. He was just like, I'm eating this because I'm hungry right now. Um, but, like, we still took him anyway. <laughs> there was, like, one dude who was, like, he worked as a, like, drug dealer, but he knew, like, agricultural techniques and stuff like that. Um, but we're like, nah, nah, we don't. <clears throat> 
we don't need anybody that's already okay with being like, this system doesn't work for me, so I'm just going to break the rules and become a drug dealer. Like, we need... Our fallout shelter has to have everybody, like, following the rules to the best of our abilities. And having a person that's unavowed, like, I will flout the rules whenever it's convenient for me was no good. <laughs> but there was two people with, like, medical knowledge. There was, a, I think her name was Selma. She was, like, a 58-year-old nurse... Um, she worked in, like, the, like, triage center or something for, a, like, a major hospital. And it was, like, all the death that she's seen has, like, left her jaded and cold. Uh, but she's still, like, a, you know, a skilled nurse. And she also, she's a heavy drinker, and she brought her two cats. So we are like, wow, man, what do we do with her? Like, being a heavy drinker is pretty bad, and, you know, she's bringing the two cats. That's not good. I was like, the two cats could be emergency food, though, so, I mean, we might as well keep the two cats. Um, I'm glad I got all my stuff. <laughs> I still have a little bit of cap to pick up some stuff on my way out. Um, but, you know, like, she seemed like she could potentially be some problems. The other person with medical knowledge, he was, like, just out of, uh, like, training to be a lieutenant in the Navy or something. Uh, he had training as, like, a medical, like, a medic there. Um, he had no flaws, but he also had his wife, who had no useful skills at all. Uh, the only information on his wife was that she was, like, seven months pregnant. Uh, and he would not come with us unless his wife also came. So, like, it was, we had to lose an extra person then, essentially, because the wife was useless. So, like, we, we took him and his useless wife. Um, there was, like, a Catholic nun. Oh, I'm trying to think of who we took. We took the Catholic nun. We took the guy and his wife. That's three. We took Jose. We took Abdullah, who was a former biker gang member. But after he spent, like, three years in prison, he converted to Islam. And, um... He's now, like, a very calm dude. He had, like, stopped a fight from happening from two of the other people. And he was also described as being, like, a linebacker, which is a uh, American football position. <clears throat> and he was the one that was, like, strong enough to open up the, uh, the door to the fallout shelter in the first place. So we, like, took him because, uh, you know, like, strength is useful. Uh, and what was that? Abdullah, Guy, Wife, Jose, Catholic Nun. Who else did we take? There's one other person we took, and um, I can't remember who it was. Oh, there was a person that had like a degree in like genetic engineering or something like that, and we took her. I was I was a little hesitant on her because I didn't think that the genetic engineering degree would be really useful in a fallout shelter. I mean, she's like a scientist, and that's like that's good, but at the same time, like she can't research. She was also like. She was, like, upper middle class or something, and she was, like, they just, it, the biography described her as, like, uh, being appalled at the idea that she wasn't going to be able to take a shower while she was in the fallout shelter and kind of stuff like that. But, yeah, after we picked those people, the, uh, the, like, interviewer dude is, like, okay, well, here's some additional information. The Navy dude says that since his wife is, uh, pregnant, she might give birth early, and, uh, that means they need an extra space for the, the baby. So you're out of the six people you took, obviously excluding him and his wife, you need to get rid of another one. So we're like, all right, well, no, we're, we're abandoning him and his wife now. They're out. <laughs> so then we had to take the cat lady that was the nurse, and then, you know, we had to take some other people. Um, the Catholic nun we took was described as being, like, very, very calming and, like, a bedrock that kind of everybody else could, like, you know, gravitate around. So we, she was, like, our emotional, like, crutch. Like I said, though, we didn't take any of the people that were, like, young and healthy and stuff like that just because they were young and healthy. Like, we abandoned the pregnant mother, which is definitely not the humanitarian aspect, but she was useless, so we abandoned her anyway. Did I walk right past the thing? I did walk right past the thing. Um, and then the dude kept, like, picking holes with our, like, plan. He's like, so you're taking a, like... A convert to Islam and a Catholic nun. You don't think that's going to lead to some interpersonal conflicts? Like, oh man. But yeah, so we did that for an hour. <laughs> there was no right answer either. Then uh, we went to another one. 
where our 13 people, we had 30 seconds to talk about ourselves, right? So, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm Silvius. I'm a 28. Um, I play Tibia. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. I go on for 30 seconds. And you know how, like, I'm not a public speaker. Nobody there was, like, a public speaker. So we're all, like, him and Holla and stuff like that. Um, so, and most of us didn't even really make the 30 seconds. So after we all talk for 30 seconds, we had to take notes on everybody, too. So everybody takes the notes on everybody else's introduction. And then he calls random people up. So he's like, Silvius, get up there. All right. And now, Silvius, you have to, for two minutes, talk about Leaf. <laughs> I'm like, uh... Leaf only spoke about himself for 30 seconds. I don't have two minutes worth of content. It's like, doesn't matter. <laughs> Gotta talk about Leaf for two minutes. So we just had to, like, make the rest up, I guess. Or try to, like, draw it out. So we did that. That took about an hour. And the final one was like a trivia game where they asked us questions about the county and stuff like that. Like Montgomery County, for instance, is uh, the third most populous county in uh, Pennsylvania behind, I would imagine, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia counties. There's 800,000 people in uh, Montgomery County. It borders Delaware, Berks, Bucks, Chester, and Philadelphia counties. Um, the size or the population of... Uh, did I... Yep, this way. The size of Montgomery County ha means it has more people in it than, like, I think, like, seven states or something like that, which is kind of interesting. Dude. Who do I... There we go. How many uh, potions do I have? Fifteen is probably enough for whatever I'm going to ultimately end up doing next. I'm not going to buy any more. And then uh, that was the end of the job, the the group interview. <laughs> um, I like I, I feel like I did okay. I feel like some other people in my group of thirteen did pretty well also. Um, but I feel like I did pretty okay. But I feel like uh, I'm losing on the um, like my job history is not great. My personal references weren't great. Uh, most of the people were like, I have a degree in criminology. I'm like, oh man, I don't have a degree in anything. I have a degree in criminal justice. Oh man. So yeah, I'm like really stressing out about this whole process because like I need the job and not getting the job will suck. Uh, and I feel like each step I've gone through, my odds of getting the job decrease. Um, you know, like it was at first it was like one test and I got a passing grade, but I got a low passing grade. And that's not that big of a deal. But then at the second test, I got another low passing grade. And, like, I, I just feel like, it, you know, other people are like, I got a 90, and then I got a 90, and then I got a 90. And I'm like, I got a 69, a 62, a 64. <laughs> like, my, I'm just, it's getting worse with each additional step. Um, oops, that's not what I meant to do. And then when I got a whole bunch of crossbows and that one double axe. Uh, so yeah, like that that's stressful. The fact that I need the job is stressful. The other thing that's stressful and it's like it's it's two things. I'm gonna say it real quick before I uh, I, I end this video. Um, I'm I'm like used to any kind of interaction involving like another person letting me down, right? Like I'm I'm used to my family like not coming through for me and things like that. Um so, like, my default assumption for this is that I'm just not going to get the job, right? Um, but on the other hand, like, I feel like I did a pretty good job, so I feel like I might get the job. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, I want to, like, temper my expectations, because, like, in the past when I've been, like, I, I have high expectations of this thing involving another person, I've been let down. So, like, I temper my expectations... Um, but I also want to be, like, excited for it at the same time. Um, and also, you know, like, if I go into the interviews being like, yeah, it doesn't matter, whatever, I'm definitely not going to get the job. Uh, so, like, that's stressing me out. Uh, and then the other thing that's, like, stressing me out, too, is that my, like, default, whenever I'm at a situation, like, whenever there's a situation in front of me and I'm like, this is probably not going to work, my default is to just be like, let's not try. Um, like, the odds of me succeeding are low, like, 20%. There's no reason for me to put the effort in 
because I'm almost certainly going to not succeed in the first place. Uh, and that's like that's what I default to all the time. Uh, and that's like so I feel like I'm probably not going to get the job. Part of that I feel like though is just my like my flawed expectations of constantly being let down by other people. But like I feel like I'm not going to get the job. So I don't want to put a whole bunch of effort into getting the job. And now like I have to get a driver's license within 25 days, 26 days. Uh, so like, I got to rush to do that and things like that. So like this is requiring like a whole bunch of effort on my part and I feel like it's wasted effort so like I don't want to do it. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I like, you know, the more effort I show, the greater the odds of me actually getting the job are. So I, I don't know. I'm very stressed out by this whole process that I have to say. Anyway, folks, that's it for me for this one. Um, as always, like, favorite, comment, subscribe, check me out on Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, and I'll see you folks later.